Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. It is Scala Days 2014. Who here is excited? <laughs> Dick, you're, you're not excited? I, I'm extremely excited. I'm so excited. If I was to let the floodgates open, it would be messy. So I'm not going to do that. It's like, it's like a Vulcan level of mind control here. Nice. So we are the Scala Wags. Uh, we, we have a Scala podcast. We're here to introduce Scala Days and give you a few housekeeping items uh, to start off with. But first, uh, yeah, so there's, there's going to be a little Scala demo and a little bit about sessions. Um, May I? Very quick. Uh, I, I don't know who all of you are, so if he, everyone can just say their name at the same time after three, please. Okay, one, two, three. Josh. Okay, got it. Thanks. Good. Make sure your name tag is still visible because our memory is perfect, so you don't... Anyway. All right. Uh, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors. There's, there's a lot of sponsors. This conference is hosted by uh, Trifork and TypeSafe together. So uh, just thanks everyone who contributed to make this conference a success, and thanks all of you guys for coming. How many of you guys are excited for football? So we got the percentage of Europeans versus Americans in the crowd there, I think. I think you have to say soccer as well. You have to clarify, it's soccer. Oh, well, I'm, I'm wearing my football hat. Yeah. Isn't, isn't, isn't it where they pick up of the ball and run? That's, that's actually barely a football team. I, I don't want to... <laughs> We're told it's Germany versus someone, and Josh thought it was the Pittsburgh Steelers, but... <laughs> so, d don't tell him, don't tell him that he'll be very disappointed. So, uh, after, the, uh, after the keynote, immediately afterwards, uh, you will want to exit quickly. There will be barbecue outside, 5.30. The game starts at 6. So, if you would like to watch the game, please go get your barbecue and come back and watch the game. Those of us who want to watch the Steelers will definitely be in this... Audium, auditorium, okay? <laughs> but it'll be shown right behind me. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. No, no. The, uh, the next thing is, uh, tomorrow's keynote starts at 9 a.m., okay? So there'll be 15-minute breaks throughout the day. Um, there'll be coffee and things outside. Make sure you get to the rooms early because there'll be a lot of people trying to get to you know, certain sessions, and you might not be able to sit in the one you like. Um, but luckily, all the sessions are going to be recorded by Parleys. Yay. So, or Parleys? Parleys? Uh, we, we had a debate about that, because I don't know if it's, if it's Parley like a meeting, or but everyone says Parleys. It's, it's the pirates you want to say. Parley. Parleys. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. And uh, I think, I think we, we forgot to mention this, but there is a Twitter for Tag Scala Days. Um, you should definitely tweet there and make sure that your tweets are nice. <laughs> Seth, Seth has a bit to teach me about being nice here. <laughs> the code of conduct for the conference is on the conference website. It's also in the app. It basically just says, don't be a jerk. Please help us make, um, make this place, make this conference uh, welcoming and safe for everyone. I'm, I'm going to translate. Uh, it was the same code of, co uh, code of conduct at DevOps. Don't be a jerk is very American. It's don't be an ass here. Okay? <laughs> if, okay. If, if here is England. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, smarty pants. What is it in German? Anyone? I out. So how did, uh, yeah, so we need a German slang for that. Um, all right, and finally, um, on Wednesday, at the very end of the conference, there'll actually be a Q&A with the Scala team. So that is at uh, 6 p.m., it's right after the last session. We encourage everyone to come and just, you know, talk with the Scala team about, you know, your issues, that sort of thing. It'll be great. You can ask them questions, whatever. Is that, Sc is that Scala issues or just general issues? It's, it's a therapy session. Um, mostly they'll be complaining about having to work with me, so, um, yeah. All right, and with that, we'd like to invite, uh, I'm going to say it wrong. Oh, no, 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 we have one last thing before this. Um, the Virtuous Labs contest. This is exciting. In your, in your pamphlet, there is an envelope um, 
from Vitrus Labs. I'm probably saying it wrong. I will always mispronounce things because I'm American. Um, in that envelope are a set of possible Scala mascots. And I'm sorry, guys, there's no capybara. Okay? I know that everybody was rooting for a capybara Scala mascot, but we're not sure if the meme's going to last. Anyway, Virtuous Labs is putting on a contest. There'll be an email address that you can send your submission to. Uh, you can play around with them, you know, whatever. Um, Okay, uh, so with that, um, as you guys are looking at these logos, we'd like to invite 47 Degrees to come on stage and introduce the Scala Android app. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, uh, I'd like to thank TypeSafe for putting together such an awesome event. Um, I know we're all excited about this week, so. Uh, I'm Aaron Regan, Director of Business Development with 47 Degrees. Uh, this is Justin Ellsbury. He's one of our four co-founders. Um, we're here to introduce the official Scala Days 2014 mobile applications for iOS and Android. Um, if you have yet to download the apps, they're available in their respective app stores, uh, as well as you can go to um, scaladays.org website and link from there. So. So the apps have all of the standard features you'd expect from a conference app, including um, a complete breakdown of the schedule. Um, you can star sessions and, uh, and then um, present a personalized view um, for you for what you want to see for the conference. In addition, uh, we aggregate all of the tweets hashtag with the um, Scala, Days, Scala Days hashtag. And, uh, and automatically hashtag those when you compose a tweet from the app. Um, in addition, you can see bios on all of the speakers. Um, um, everybody's uh, badges has a QR code on it. You can scan the QR code to collect um, contact information as you network around the event. Um, you can also see all of the locations for the different venues, including the um, party at the weekend club, um, the community party. And yeah, just a little more background about 47 Degrees and who we are. Uh, we're a creative digital agency with offices in the U.S. and Spain. Um, our focus is designing and developing native iOS and Android applications, as well as providing consulting um, for the TypeSafe platforms, uh, Scala, Akka, and Play. So uh, we'd love to meet you all this week. Um, if you have any questions regarding the app, feel free to um, reach out to us in person at the events. Um, you can follow us on Twitter, at 47DEG. Um, and yeah, we look forward to connecting. So enjoy the conference. So uh, one final thing, at the end of each session, there will be a person with a tablet. That tablet is not for you to take with you. It's for you to vote on the session. Uh, hopefully, it's an intuitive user interface. We really tried hard. Um, the key here is that red button. Remember the don't be a jerk thing, right? If, like, if, if there was a serious problem with the session, it's OK to say something negative. If there's something really positive, be positive. But please, make sure you give valuable feedback to the speakers. Um, and that's as a speaker, it's really important to kind of see how things went over. So uh, we highly appreciate you guys voting. So the next, the next bit that we're going to do quick, uh, and this is becoming a Scalawax tradition, um, there was a, a, a member uh, with TypeSafe, Phil Bagwell. He was a member of the Scala community. He was really influential to just bring Scala to the masses. Um, he was a professor at EPFL, uh, and he, he um, passed away from cancer. Um, so in his honor, uh, due to his just uh, amazing uh, influence in the Scala community, we give away an award to who we think was the, just the, the greatest contributor to the Scala community that year. Um, and so this year, uh, the, the award goes to Lalit Plant, founder and creator of Kojo. So 
I like to I, I like to very quickly roll out the um, story of when I met Phil uh, at times like this because it really is one of those don't be a jerk kind of stories. Uh, I'm, it's at the Scala days that happened in Palo Alto. God, that must be three years ago, something like that. And uh, I'm standing in the lunch queue and uh, start talking with this guy. I don't know who he is. Uh, had a really nice conversation about all sorts of stuff. Got deep into data structures. And uh, I'm like, wow, that was really good. Walked away never knowing who it was. And about two weeks later, saw a picture of Phil Bagwell. I'm like, that's him. I met him. So uh, that, was, that was a really nice one. And about Kojo, in case you don't know what it is, uh, hopefully some of you do, uh, Kojo uh, was instrumental in winning the uh, Java 1 scripting bowl a couple of years ago. I, I chose it as a way of showing that Scala can be simple. Uh, it is an environment for kids, a bit like Logo. Uh, very simple to just get something up and running, and kids love it because they can see stuff happen uh, immediately. So I think it's a wonderful uh, uh, thing for the award to go to. So. Hello, everyone. Uh, it's an honor for me to get the Phil Bagwell Award uh, this year. I actually had the pleasure of uh, collaborating with Phil for about a year uh, during the course of my work with Kojo. And during this time, Phil made some uh, big contributions to Kojo. First with the Scala tutorial that's included right within Kojo. And then by giving me very constructive and very hands-on feedback on uh, pretty much every new feature that was added to Kojo uh, during this time. So getting this award today in his name is a special moment for me and adds to my motivation to continue to work in the area of Scala and education and of showing via Kojo how Scala can be used in simple yet powerful ways. This was important to Phil and continues to be important to me. So thank you once again and all the best for a great conference. So, so Lee wasn't able to make it because he's still uh, teaching in India, so we're just thankful that he could uh, send us this video. If any of you have kids or if any of you know kids and they want to know where you are these days and what Scala is, just have them download Kojo and they can try it. Okay. Uh, so our next speaker is, is who again? It's, um, it's M something? Some, some, it's some guy. It's oh. Okay, uh, Scala, the simple parts. Uh, Martin Odursky will be showing you uh, and telling you uh, why if kids can program Scala with Kojo that probably the rest of us can too. <laughs> Thank you. So, Welcome all and thanks for being here in Berlin. It's super exciting to see uh, the fifth Scala Days. So we have progressed from the first meeting in Lausanne with 140 people now to 800 feet people sold out uh, two months ahead. This is really fantastic to see uh, the, the community grow and becoming more solid. I just wanted to add, before I go in my talk, one other little thing about Phil Bagwell, because we were speaking about him. In fact, Phil Bagwell was not a professor at EPFL. He was a manager at uh, Digital Equipment, um, and then was a freelance manager. And uh, when I was a young professor at EPFL, about 12 years back, he came once in, uh, to my lab, he knocked at the door, and he said, look, um, I have these ideas about data structures, and uh, I would like to write a paper and submit it to a conference, but how do I know that the program committee doesn't, wouldn't steal my, my ideas? And I told him, well, you know, it's not like in industry pro academic program committees, they're not really in the business of stealing ideas. But if you want to be absolutely sure, then you make a tech technical report uh, uh, under the EPFL logo, and I would be happy to have you write, uh, essentially have the report being published as the reports of my group. And that's how our collaboration started. So Phil then, of course, uh, wrote a lot of uh, very influential structure, papers on data structures, which have been used in uh, Scala, and I think even before Scala and Clojure, and I heard that Haskell now is also adopting these. So it's, it's been very, very influential. Good. So uh, about this talk, um, I, what I would like to do is get back to the simple parts of Scala because I think uh, 
fundamentally, at least when I write Scala, I find it rather simple. And uh, uh, the, I don't think it's just me. Uh, I value Scala because it lets me do things in very simple ways, and I wanted to give you some of taste of what are these things that I value. Uh, Scala, in fact, is now uh, 10 years old, uh, so time flies. The first time we came out with it was in 2004, uh, and here this, here's the original announcement that went to the mailing list. Uh, uh, so we said we uh, like to announce the availability of a new language which uh, smoothly integrates object-oriented and functional programming. And then here are three points that we emphasized. Uh, so one was abstract types and mix in composition that unify ideas from object and module systems. The second was pattern matching over class hierarchies that unifies functional and object-oriented data access and also greatly simplifies the processing of XML trees. So XML was at the time sort of the new hotness. Everybody was thinking that languages should have XML everywhere. Uh, XML was the standard interface format. And for me, XML was at the time sort of the showcase for function programming because if you haven't been around by then, uh, you uh, probably did, maybe don't know that 10 years ago, if you said function programming is great, you were, people would laugh at you. We're completely, completely heretic. Uh, function programming essentially was a complete niche uh, paradigm and of course everybody would write object-oriented programs and object-oriented only. And uh, the object-oriented dogmas were running very deeply, and one of that dogma was, well, we have classes, and you have the data, and you put the methods where the data are. And functional programming, of course, doesn't adhere to that dogma. It has essentially data types and functions that are separate. So XML was the classical case where I said, well, with XML data, you can't put your methods into an XML tree because XML is defined for you. It's pure data. There's nothing we can do about it. You have to access an XML tree from the outside, and functional programming lets you do that. So it seemed to be the first use case of functional programming. That's why we added XML to the language. Now, of course, there are many others, uh, parallelism, concurrency, and so on. Functional programming has become respectable. But, and in fact, uh, XML, essentially, it's probably time we snap this um, umbilical cord and uh, uh, use XML just as one of many string interpolators, which will probably happen in the future. But at the time, it was very important. And the third one was, sorry, uh, a flexible syntax and type system that enables the construction of advanced libraries and new domain-specific languages. And that certainly has happened to a very large degree. So 10 years, and uh, it was, uh, by all accounts, 10 very successful years. I think Scala's user community is pretty large for a language in its age groups, so about uh, hard to count, but probably it's conservative to talk about 100,000 developers. Uh, a more solid number is 200,000 subscribers to the two Coursera courses I gave uh, with uh, Roland Kuhn and Eric Meyer, the second one, and number 13 in the Red Monk language ratings that compare uh, GitHub uh, comments and Stack Overflow questions on two axes. Uh, and what's more important than these numbers is that we have many, many, many successful rollouts and happy users. That's, that's the rewarding thing. That's the important thing. On the other hand, uh, we also see now that Scala is also discussed more controversially than usual for a language at its, at its stage of adoption. I mean, after all, even though Scala is very successful, it's not C++, right? It's not universal that, and, uh, uh, that everybody would, would feel inclined to bitch about it. So why is it controversial? Well, I think there are actually two things happening. One is uh, the internal controversies that different communities in, uh, of Scala users don't always agree what programming in Scala should be. And I think that's healthy. That's also part of the uh, natural thing that happens if you have a fairly orthogonal and general language that you, you can interpret it in different ways. But it's also a challenge. And the internal controversies often lead them to complaints that others echo. Uh, one of these complaints that you hear quite a bit is that Scala is too academic, coming from your academic roots. But you also hear quite a lot that Scala has sold out to industry. Uh, people often complain that Scala's types are too hard, but some others complain that the types are far from being strict enough, that you have to be far, far more strict uh, with, with the types. And uh, a lot of people complain that Scala is everything and the kitchen sink. And that's actually the complaint that I find most 
vexing and frustrating because when I created Scala, I wanted to be the exact opposite of that. I wanted it to be a very general language that lets you build many different things with a few primitives that compose well. And I want to take the rest of this talk to sort of convince you that at least the core of Scala is precisely that. So I believe all these are signs that we haven't made it clear enough what the core, what the essence of programming in Scala is. So let's have a look what we said so far. So, so far, one picture I've showed in the majority of my talk was this one, which says Scala is a unifier. It unifies object-oriented and functional programming, and you sort of got by lucky coincidence of a language also that unifies a lot of uh, size degrees. So it's a very good scripting language. Dick has said, well, he won the script bowl, uh, the popularity context of essentially scripting languages using Kojo. And at the same time, of course, it's also, we know that the language is used as the backbone of a large number of successful companies. Uh, Twitter comes to mind, but so, so do many others. It drives the business of Walmart Canada and many, many other companies rely on Scala, not just for an isolated application, but for their core business. So the word we said there was that Scala is a scalable language. That's in fact the root of the name. Scala means scalable language. And if you look at the meaning of what scalable is, then there are two meanings really. There's a more direct one and, uh, and an indirect one. Uh, the direct one would mean that scalable means growable. So that means we have a language that can be molded into new languages by adding domain-specific libraries, by adding libraries, either domain-specific or general. And if you don't know precisely what, what that is, a growable language, then I can really recommend you this talk, Growing a Language. If you do know what it is, I still recommend you to see this talk, Growing a Language, because it's an absolutely beautiful talk by Guy Steele. Uh, that gives you not just the logical, uh, the, not just the definition, but the feeling of what a growable language is. The second meaning is a language enabling growth. So that would be a language that can be used for small as well as for large systems. And furthermore, that allows a smooth transition from small to large, because after all, that's how probably most projects start. They start as a really small project, and before you look around, it's grown to substantial size, and then it's become this monster. And uh, uh, the importance for a language that essentially supports you all the way is that you never outgrow your abstractions. You never, you never are in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a system where suddenly you say, well, my, the way I wrote this program, I, I, can't, I can't support that anymore. So let's look at the first meaning first. So Scala definitely is a growable language. Uh, it has several traits that make it so. Uh, so in particular, it has a very flexible syntax, flexible type systems, the user-definable operators, higher order functions, implicits, and all these make it relatively easy to build new domain-specific libraries on top of Scala. And where this fails, you can always use the macro system, even so, so far it's labeled experimental. So you have lots of tools that let you write essentially your own dialect, so to speak, on top of Scala. And that has certainly happened. Uh, it had, has happened many, many times. Uh, so there are many, many of these domain-specific languages that are built on top of Scala. I only give you some uh, representative sample. If you start here, so Chisel is a language for hardware definition. Uh, Spark, of course, is the big data framework. Uh, Spray for HTTP uh, routing and dispatch. Shapeless for uh, advanced type manipulation, type level programming. Scala Z for monads and more. Uh, Slick for database access. Squirrel is another one for database access. Then we have the testing framework, Scala test specs. Uh, our beloved ACA for the actors, uh, and this patch would be another HTTP framework, and of course, SBT, the Scala build tool, is just another DSL that sits on top of Scala. So this has happened, and you could say, well, this growth strategy definitely has been successful, otherwise there wouldn't have been so many languages on top of Scala. But it's growable always good? Well, in, in fact, it's a double-edged sword, because uh, the 
many domain-specific languages, having all these domain-specific languages, also can fracture the user community. You might have different subgroups that don't agree anymore what programming in Scala should be like because they are used to their own domain-specific language uh, or domain-specific languages that they use. That explains at least in part sort of the internal controversies that I said when we, uh, that, that I mentioned when we started the talk. And besides, of course, no language is liked by everyone that holds for mainstream languages such as Scala as well as for the DSLs that run on top of Scala. So that means no DSL will probably find universal approval. And finally, host languages often get the blame for the DSLs they embed. So there are many people who say, I hate Scala because I've seen this program, which is a DSL on top of Scala, and it looks weird to me. So that, that, that's why this must be a very, very strange language uh, because it embeds this DSL. So I believe global is, I don't want to talk bad, only bad about it. I, I say it's really great because it lets you do these things. It lets you go into new applications, big data, hardware, and uh, build tools, for instance. And it's definitely also always great for experimentation, that you can really mold what you need in a certain direction. But for production use, it then demands discipline, discipline to sort of conform to the uh, set of idioms that you have chosen as a team or as a company, and uh, it demands discipline as you grow things. So the second meaning of Scala would be a language that enables growth. And that's definitely also true because you can start with a one-liner. You can experiment very quickly using the REPL or the Scala worksheet. You can grow without fearing to fall off the cliff. And uh, uh, you can, while you can start very small, you can end very large indeed. So Scala deployments now go into the millions of lines of code. Uh, so the language also works for very, very large programs. Uh, the tools are, are it's true, uh, challenged. So uh, build times sometimes are painful, uh, but they're catching up. So one hour recent efforts to tame the build times were a much better incremental compilation, and I think that's already bearing fruit. So a large system, I heard that from James Belsey, who is in the audience, I don't know where it came from. A good definition of a large system is a, it's a system where you do not know that some of its components even exist. So that's sort of the lesson to draw of what a large system is and how you have to work with one. So what enables this growing, uh, growing uh, program from small to large? I believe it's actually the unique combination of object-oriented and functional features that Scala ha has. And if I look at actual deployments of very, very large systems, then I find that typically they really rely on both. They're typically predominantly functional. Functional is definitely very important. But they also make use of a lot of the advanced features that we have on the composition side, on the object composition side. They definitely use classes and traits and self-types and dependent types and so on. Unfortunately, there's no established term for this combination. So some people have proposed object functional, but I don't like names with a hyphen in them. Uh, it's, it's, it feels so, sort of like a hybrid, nothing, nothing specific. And besides object functional, it's particularly problematic because the two communities don't exactly uh, get along well with each other. Um, so uh, one good quote about that is quite prescient, actually, was by James Irie. I think it was uh, four years ago when he wrote that. So it's in his uh, brief, incomplete, and mostly wrong history of programming languages, which is hilarious, uh, generally. So the last entry in that was this one here. A drunken Martin Odeski sees a Reese's butter, peanut butter cup at featuring somebody's peanut butter getting on somebody else's chocolate. Well, for the Euro, us Europeans here, you probably don't know too well what that is, but the Americans would know, and has an idea. He creates Scala language that unifies constructs from both object and functional pro languages. This pisses off both groups, and each promptly declares jihad. So, <laughs> uh, thanks, thanks, James. 
And he was right. I mean, at the time it was funny, but uh, I think it was, uh, in retrospect, he was absolutely right. Uh, the jihad is definitely happening. It's not just in the Scala community, but it seems now it's a, it's a rather general big fight, but a lot of the core jihad is, is happening in the, in the Scala community. So object functional, that's kind of um, problematic, too loaded as a term. So I would like to propose another view which fits actually best, better what, what Scala is in my uh, mind. So I would like to say that Scala is really all about <coughs> modularity. It's a modular language. So what do I mean by that? So modular programming means that systems should be composed from modules. And what's a module? Well, a module should be a simple part that can, can be combined with other modules in interesting ways, to in many ways, to give interesting results. And simple typically means encapsulates one functionality. So it serves one purpose and can be combined well. So that's modular. And you could say, well, isn't that old hat? Uh, should we all go back to modular 2? Uh, modular 2 was a language that even had modular in the, in the name. And in fact, I'm very fond of modular 2, the first the first uh, compiler I wrote was a Modular 2 compiler, and I then got, I went on and got my PhD from Niklaus Wirt, who was the inventor of Modular 2, so definitely Modular 2 was a very influential language for me. Uh, but I'm not proposing we go back to Modular 2, because uh, since Modular 2, the world has changed. In particular, we, are no, we don't want to be limited any longer by the von Neumann bottleneck. Uh, so uh, this is a photo not on von Neumann, but of uh, John Backus. John Backus was the inventor of Fortran, the first high-level language uh, of, of them all. And uh, by the time he got the Turing Award, which is the highest award uh, given out for a computer scientist, he actually changed his, his opinion, or he, he thought that there was time for something different, uh, namely functional programming. And the reason he gave was that with traditional imperative programming, we're limited by the von Neumann bottleneck, which means that imperative programs really simulate a von Neumann computer. There's the memory, which are words, and those words are your variables. There's a processor, and you have loads and stores, which means that essentially you operate by single words. And uh, a word can be a, a, an integer or a, a floating point number or a pointer. But that's basically what you have in imperative languages. Uh, and the problem with that is passing, uh, scale, scaling up. Because one, once you scale up, single words are not big enough. Uh, you want to have richer types like um, uh, graphs or polynomials or texts or URLs or things like that. And for these richer types, what you need is essentially a way to treat them mathematically, to treat them as their foundations. And what these types do not, that certainly do not have is mutation. So if I have a URL and I change an element of my URL, then I won't have the same URL. I will have a different URL. Whereas imperative programming, of course, lets me change the URL, but keep the pointer the same so it's still the same thing. So that's why John Buckles has argued that we need something new. And uh, we, I, I believe that's definitely true, that today's systems need richer models and implementations. The second author who drove the point home for me then was John Hughes. I think that's, uh, at least for me, was the second most influential paper that sort of convinced me that functional programming was a good idea. Uh, why functional programming matters, 1985. So he also essentially said that functional programming is good because it leads to modules that can be combined freely. If you know that paper, it's a very short paper. It just gives you a simple algorithm for uh, some uh, uh, newton raphson approximation of square roots. And he says, well, here I have a loop, an imperative loop, and there's the, essentially the iteration step and the dampening and the termination condition all in the same loop. And if you want to pull out these individual things and put them in a pipeline to be combined freely, then we, we, what we do is functional programming. So that was his argument, that functional programming is good because it's more modular. Okay, so um, does it mean that functional programming is always the same as modular? Well, not necessarily, actually, no. So uh, modular, what I said, essentially simple parts that can be combined freely uh, to, to, to give other parts. There are some, even in, in very strong and good functional languages, there are some exceptions to the rule. For instance, you could argue that Haskell's type classes are not very modular, 
Well, why? Because uh, they force you to give a, an instance definition for a, a certain class, and that definition would be valid for the whole program. Now, what is a program in a large system? I just told you a large system is one where you don't even know that certain components exist. So that means, of course, that you wouldn't know about the instance definitions that are, exist elsewhere in the program, and that means you might have conflicts, and you have to manage the conflicts, and it will all get very messy. There are similar things also in other languages like OCaml where you have implicitly assume a global namespace and definitely global namespaces are never really modular. And one can discuss about whether dynamic typing is, uh, is, is a problem for modularity. It could be a problem, I would argue it's a problem because you want interfaces that you can check uh, strongly. So essentially you, you want to check, have certain security guarantees for your interfaces, for your APIs that, that you wouldn't have so easily when you do dynamic typing. Okay, objects and modules are not synonyms either, so even though object-oriented languages are in some way regarded as the successors of the first wave of modular languages, uh, there are a number of non, not very mod modular features in object-oriented languages, starting with Smalltalk's virtual image, where you say that's a monolithic application, uh, some uh, object-oriented languages have monkey patching. That's sort of the analog of type classes, only worse. Uh, it means that you uh, can put arbitrary methods from arbitrary places into your objects, and there, of course, that's also a big invitation of conflicts, uh, overriding of, of conflicts between uh, all these uh, monkey patch methods that each look like a great idea in, in individually, but when you combine them, the system just would behave in unpredictable ways. Uh, and then there are problems with uh, mutable state, uh, which essentially makes transformations often very difficult because it gives you interfaces that are not, not checked in the types. And then there are rather weak composition and de decomposition fac facilities that essentially manifest in themselves that you need external dependency injection frameworks. That's definitely a shortcoming of the language when, if you need that. And the decomposition facilities encourage mixing domain models with their applications. I'm going to show an example a little bit later for that. Okay, so if we talk about modules as simple parts that can be combined freely, let's start with the language itself. So languages have features, they have parts. Uh, what are the simple, the so-called modules in Scala? What are the simple parts that can be combined freely? Um, and I've thought of a long time about that, what are really the important parts that I think I use all the time and I combine all the time. And uh, I have found out that, in fact, a good way to describe them is to associate them with actions, with verbs, with what we as programmers do. So here I propose seven verbs that lead to seven simple parts in Scala. We compose, we decompose or match, we group things, we recurse, we abstract things, we aggregate things, and sometimes we even mutate. Um, as always, I should say, simple is not easy, quoting Rich Hickey. Uh, the uh, easy means it's familiar, it's, what you, it's close to what you know already, and therefore it's, e it's easy for you to absorb, whereas really simple means uh, it does one functionality can be combined well with others. Uh, the two are not necessarily the same thing. So let's start with the first thing, compose. So composing, of course, is a fundamental uh, activity when we program, and it's made very simple in Scala because in Scala everything is an expression. So that means everything can be plugged into everything else. So that's a big, big advantage because it means you can write as an expression an if uh, expression like this one here. You don't need to assign this stuff into a variable that you reuse later on. And you can do that not only for if expressions, but also essentially for all the other uh, things that you would normally see as a statement. So uh, in, instead of C uh, or, uh, or Java switch, there's this match expression, which lets you pattern matching. And of course, the try is also an expression that lets you return something from the expression rather than acting by a side effect. So, that means that because everything is an expression, everything is composable with everything else. The second uh, ac fundamental activity would be the opposite of that. So we compose, uh, and then of course, the, the dual of that would be decomposition. We decompose things. We want to analyze, if you have a data structure, what are its parts and act on the parts. 
Uh, and that is done in a very uh, uh, simple and fundamental way using pattern matching. So uh, pattern matching in Scala is, of course, integrated well in object-oriented programming. So we express that typically by defining case classes that extend a common trait. So here you would have the simple example of a number and a plus a node that gives you different forms of an arithmetic expression, and they both extend this common trait expression. And once you've set up things like this, then you can evaluate these uh, case classes uh, with a separate method. For instance, if you want to uh, use an eval method that gives you the result of uh, the, the number that this expression tree should represent, then uh, you would use a match. And, well, if your expression is a number uh, with an integer n, then that's the result. And if it's a plus with a uh, with an left and right expression, then you would recursively evaluate the two subnodes and add those. So I believe that's really simple and it's flexible even though it's a bit verbose. It's not as concise as, as it could be. There are functional languages, uh, more traditional functional languages like Haskell or ML that give you special syntax for these sort of things. In Scala, we didn't want to do that because uh, essentially of uh, the idea that we wanted to have only one way to uh, <coughs> express concrete data, and that way are classes. We didn't want to have separate types beyond the, 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 the classes and objects that we had there. So that's why we said, well, we want to have the uh, pattern matching done over the class hierarchy itself rather than over separate sum types. And it's worked out well because it gives us also a lot of flexibility uh, in, that, in that we can have open as well as closed sums and also in the types, in the kind of types that we can use for these things. Okay, so the traditional object-oriented alternative for these things would be probably something like this. It would be to put the methods inside the data types. Uh, so what we would do here is we would write the trait expression and there would be an abstract method eval. And that would be implemented uh, for numbers like this. So we just return the constructor argument and for plus like this. And that, of course, means you have now a choice. So the, the, the combination, the combinability of the parts gives you a choice how you want to combine them. Do you want to put essentially the, the fact that you can put things inside classes? Do you want to make use of that? Or do you want to make use of the fact that you can afterwards decompose classes? And I believe it, it depends. Uh, but uh, there are very good use cases for both of these things. So just to concentrate on the project, on the problems here, I think the, this is okay if the operations that you do on these classes are fixed and very few. But on the other hand, if your operations are a large set, then it becomes problematic because what you do here essentially is you mix the data model with the business logic. And uh, the problem with that is that often the data model and the business logic have different lifetimes. So the data model might be much more long-lived than your business model. It might be used for essentially interchange and serialization and communication with other applications. So you want to keep it fixed. But the business logic might change next month or next year, so that is actually something that you might want to change rather often. And the functional approach to uh, pattern matching gives you precisely that. It lets you essentially freeze this part and evolve this part as you need. Whereas the object-oriented, the classical object-oriented model, sorry, uh, is essentially mixes both and that can become problematic. So it, it essentially depends on a choice of when something is appropriate, the object-oriented uh, alternative might be appro is uh, appropriate if essentially the amounts of uh, alternatives, so the, uh, the number of classes that you have here is essentially open, and you have that typically for uh, graphical user interfaces and, and, and things like that. So the third thing we do with, uh, when we program, I believe, is group. We group things together. Uh, going, at, going to scale as always involves a certain grouping, and uh, that is helped in Scala because everything can be grouped in the same way everywhere. So everything can be grouped and nested. There's a static scoping discipline. And uh, 
the same rules apply for, for both terms and types. So, uh, as you know, a name in Scala can mean both a term and a type, depending on context, but the same rules apply to each. Whereas if you contrast with a language like Java, then you have four different namespaces. You have fields and methods and classes and packages, and each of these has different resolution rules. They have different scoping rules for each of the four. So that I would, would be complicated in my book, whereas this uh, Scala's approach here is really simple. So uh, the simplicity actually leads to an important program refactoring principle that uh, I often apply or tell others to apply and that is one of the, I would say, maybe rookie mistakes that Scala programmers or general functional programmers often do is uh, that they pack too much in an expression. Just because one can write these things, I mean, that looks really impressive. You can definitely get a lot of things done in an expression. So it's sort of this, you write this thing and say, ah, oh, yeah, yeah, I just have to add this. Well, just add this other combinator and add this combinator and then put it in braces and wrap it with that and things like that. And before you, before you know, you end up with things like this. Um, so it's amazing what you can done, get done in a single statement, but it does not mean you have to do it. So one important thing here is to say, well, uh, what you should do instead is find meaningful names for sub-expressions. So I have refactored this expression to make it more legible. So here we, we, it's, it's actually part, it was part of our compiler code base. Uh, so we, we, we uh, essentially define what our sources are, what the workspace routes are. Then we have essentially a way to get the files of an entry. And then finally what we do is we go through the sources and give for each entry, uh, get for each entry the files and concatenate them all together. That's what this thing does. Now, um, in a language like Java, or uh, well, I don't want to single out Java all the time, let's say in traditional mainstream languages, because C-sharp and uh, C, they're basically all the same, uh, you have this conundrum to say, well, if I do that, then I have to put all these things into my class uh, as separate methods, uh, these uh, workspace rules and files of entry. And that means I have to put a doc comment on it, uh, even though they're private and the classes will become much bigger. Should I really do that? Ah, no, I just let, let, let's just roll this into my loop. And before you know it, you will have programs, maybe not with large expressions, but with definitely with a statement soup and very, very large loops. Uh, in Scala, in generally functional languages, what you can do is you just put this whole thing in braces and you're done, right? And that's essentially this power of nesting. If you say, because I can nest, I can also refactor and name at liberty, and I, it, I, I don't pay the price of that in global namespace pollution. I can have the names as close to my data as possible. So I think this is a very important principle. Uh, number four, then, is uh, recurse. Uh, so uh, recursion lets us compose to arbitrary depths. That's the importance about it. Without recursion, everything we, we, would, we would do is finite and would end very quickly, unless we use a loop, but uh, that, that's imperative and we're not talking about that yet. So I believe recursion actually is um, largely overlooked in Scala programs, I see, uh, and I think mm, unjustifiably so. So I think it actually deserves uh, a, a bigger role than it's usually given by people. So uh, what uh, I often see is that we often, well, essentially we all as Scala programmers, what we try to do is we first try to reach essentially for a good combination of combinators to express what we want in the collection libraries or elsewhere. And this is the right approach, definitely. But sometimes it fails. It fails because you don't have the right combinators or there are too many movable parts that you have to essentially keep in sync at the same time. Or sometimes you are worried about really having the optimum, optimal performance for this piece of code and you don't know what the overhead of your combinators is. And sometimes in this case we fall back and say, well, maybe I should do a loop, uh, uh, imperative loop and uh, write it with a loop. But there is this, this essentially intermediate step to say, no, uh, let's write it as a tail recursive function, uh, as a recursive function. So just put all the movable parts as parameters, and then in the next step, instead of going essentially back to the loop, you just recurse, like here with the same length. 
And uh, you can have the assurance that this thing is just as fast as a loop. Uh, if you put telrec in front of it, then the compiler will actually complain if it can't essentially expand this thing into something that is uh, e exactly as fast as the fastest loop you could write. So recursion, and in particular tail recursion, is a great fallback for the times where you say, uh, my combinators are just not sufficient for this thing, but I don't want to fall back to imperative programming. Number five, uh, abstract. So we, what we do is we compute. Functional programming is about computations, and when we abstract computations and we give them a name, and uh, the, if we want to use it then as parts of an expression, then become, we get two functions that are set themselves values. And of course, uh, Scala has a very rich way to do that, uh, so, so those uh, functions can be named or uh, anonymous, and uh, you can combine them in uh, very flexible ways. But this one is, of course, pretty standard by now. So everybody, uh, basically all of the languages, all of the mainstream languages by now have this idea of uh, function values that you can use. So that you can say that's sort of the first step where functional programming has really taken over the world. Number six would be aggregate. So we typically don't work with single elements. We work with collections. And uh, these collections are used there for aggregating data. And the Scala view of collections is very much to, to say, well, we want to transform immutable collections instead of doing the traditional create, read, update, delete cycles. Uh, that's enabled and made simple by a very uniform set of operations that are simple to use. So it means that once you know your combinators, then you can just apply them anywhere. Uh, whether you want, you're working with uh, sets or uh, arrays or lists or uh, parallel collections or distributed collections, uh, it's all the, sets, the same set of operators that you can use there. Okay, so I believe that actually collections are a big success story for Scala because of this uniformity of use. So that essentially they apply everywhere in exactly the same way and you can be confident that essentially what you've learned here applies over there. But it's been, uh, at least in some uh, uh, discussion, it's been controversial because of the types. So the main uh, controversy about collections is uh, that the type of map is, depending on how you see it, either ugly or a lie. So let's see what, what, what could be meant by that. So if we look at, let's say, the type of map for arrays, then it actually looks pretty good. It takes a function from A to B, and if you apply it to, on an array of A, then it gives you back an array of B. That's what, what map should be, of course. But of course, there's this ominous use case, which says this is not the whole story. There's, there's more to that, and if you essentially uh, click on the use case and then the full signature, you see this thing here, uh, which is indeed uh, much more complicated than the first type of map you started with. So what that says is that it now takes two parameters, B and that, and uh, there's an implicit uh, parameter called a can build from, which says, well, if you take an array T and you want to build something with elements B, then uh, essentially the implicit will tell you what the result type is. So why is that? Um, why not define it like this, which we, of course, could also do in Scala. We could define a functor, and a functor has then a, a map function which takes the, the two element types, and uh, it essentially then goes from functor of T to functor of U. And in fact, when uh, Scala 2.8 came out and I designed the collections with some other people, then uh, that was essentially the original motivation for doing Scala collections. It says, now we have higher kind of types, we can do this stuff, great, let's redesign the collection libraries. And it only later we found out that actually, no, this doesn't work. Uh, here's one thing that doesn't work, uh, arrays don't work anymore. Why? Well, uh, if we build a new array, so if F would be array, we build an array of U, then actually the uh, Java Virtual Machine doesn't let us do that. You can't create a generic array. You need to have a class tag or some essentially physical representation of the type you wanted to create because that needs to be stored in the, in the array that gets created. Um, so more generally, uh, it doesn't work in any case where we need some additional information to build 
uh, a new collection. So for instance, if you wanted to build an ordered set, we need an ordering. And again, uh, the functor signature that you see here, it has no place for either a class tag or an ordering. It just goes from, t it, it takes a function from t to u and uh, a collection of f of t and gives you a collection of f of u. There's no parameter for a class tag or an ordering or anything like that. So that means that the pure signature of functors only works in cases which are sort of completely generic, so where you don't need any additional information, and that means that you would have a very uh, uh, small collection library indeed that only works for these cases. For these cases, you could, uh, you could envision it, but not in the general case. So that's precisely what is achieved by this can build from parameter. So if you look back, then actually what this type here is, it really is the type that the user sees. So that as a user, that's all you need to see. Because it, as a user says, they say, I have an array of A, and applying a function from A to B, I will get an array of B. I will get, get that back. What you need the big type for is uh, a, another uh, reason, and that is that you want to have a single definition of map in your whole collection library everywhere, a single definition that applies to everything. Why? Why do you need that? Well, first, avoid uh, uh, dry, don't repeat yourself. Uh, but the importance here is really that if you don't do that, if you force different collections to re-implement map, then you get a lot of code duplication. And what's worse is you get a lot of divergence because uh, the, the fact of the matter is that uh, if people, different people writing the same collection libraries will do things differently. Some might introduce bugs in some part of the collection which are not in others. Some might use one name which are not in others. So for instance, some people might want to uh, call append concat or concat append and before you know it you will have two different operators, one called append and one called concat. All this happened before Scala 2.8 collections. We saw essentially the libraries degrade the more contributions there were and that's why we sort of stepped down and said no, we want to have a single way to do everything and then, of course, that way must be very, very generic. So it must know how to build an array and an ordered set, and that's precisely what uh, can build from essentially gives you here. Okay, uh, I'll skip over the second collection because we are, uh, all, I, I want to keep within the time, and I don't want you to, uh, uh, to, 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 to miss the football game, of course, so I have to look at the time here a little bit. Okay, so the last point on the list uh, is mutate, and it's last for a reason, because you should use it with restraint, but I think it's definitely uh, one of the things that you, uh, there's a reason why it is in Scala, and there are reasons where you want to mutate state. Uh, the problematic thing about that, of course, is that to say, well, aren't variables and mutation anti-modular? And indeed they are, uh, many usages of them are. So in particular, if you have global state, so you have different components and they all access global state, that is, not, that is difficult for modularity because you have these hidden dependencies then between your components. So that's, that's not very good at all. But used, widely mutable, used wisely mutable state can cut down on boilerplate and increase efficiency and clarity. So um, I have actually done a cataloging of where I used mutable state recently in the .c, which is a newly developed compiler for Scala. Um, and .c is a compiler that, unlike the previous generations of compilers I wrote, is much more functional. So it has actually a very, very functional architecture. But nevertheless, state is used in a number of places. Uh, so uh, the idea of the compiler is you want to be purely functional, uh, how can you also be fast? Because that's another aim of, for, for the compiler to be a very fast compiler. So uh, you have to sort of play to the strength of what function programming can do. And one of the strengths is, well, it gives you a lots of opportunities for caching. Because when you have a function and you apply the function several times, then every time you apply it to the same arguments, you will get, the same, get back the same result. So if the function is expensive to compute, then it might actually be worth it to actually store the last result of a computation in a table, and when you get to the arguments, uh, to the same arguments, you can retrieve that. 
So that's caching. But caching, as we know, is an art, so you can't just do it blindly by throwing in a language feature. It really depends how you do it and when it's profitable. So I found that I actually, we actually use caching for a number of things. One is the simple lazy valves that are a form of cache, the memorized functions, the interned names, uh, and there are even LRU caches, so least recently used caches that have a bounded size that essentially throw out things as they age. All these caches, of course, are built with mutable state, but they are, in a sense, they don't violate the functional uh, spirit of the whole thing because they're not visible from the outside. A cache is just essentially used internally to make this thing faster. From the outside, things are still as purely functional as before, and that's what matters. Uh, there are other usages that follow the same uh, mold. Uh, one is persisting, so the idea there was one, one, once a value is stable, store it in an object, so that avoids uh, essentially memory leaks in big tables and also speeds up the access. Um, copy on write, so one thing we do here is uh, we avoid copying when going from an untyped tree to a typed tree. So there the idea is essentially you have a single field in an untyped tree, that contains a type. And what you can do is, when you get the untyped tree first, you can essentially have a single usage, an imperative usage, which is free. You can just put a type there uh, because there was none before, and actually the, the, the way trees are types, type prevents you from finding out about that. But then once you try to put a second value, a different type into the same tree, you do copy and write. You say, well, now uh, essentially I'm out of options here to keep the purely functional way, way uh, I, I need to copy. Uh, the, fourth, uh, the fourth usage was fresh values. So we often want to generate a fresh name, a unique ID. That's another thing where we don't want to essentially uh, go and go to a functional name supply or things like that. Much simpler to just increment a counter and put that in a name somehow. Uh, all these things, I guess, would still be um, uh, more or less functional. The last one, fresh values. Uh, uh, is essentially functional only on a pragmatic value, maybe not on a theoretical one. And once we're done with all these things, then actually in the compiler there remain two variables. It's the current constraint and the current diagnostics. So there's a constraint that essentially uh, uh, rules type inference and the diagnostics is essentially all the error messages you write. And these are indeed uh, uh, mutable. And, uh, but they're more than mutable because we have to version them and we have to explore them. So they're, they're these two variables that the whole compiler is about. So you could say, well, okay, uh, you have two variables. Uh, why don't you put them in a monad? So monads are uh, essentially a great design patterns for many things that are very, uh, very similar, uh, uh, things that have essentially flat map and map on them. Um, and one thing we could, of course, do is put a monad, a state monad, with these two variables. So where we would have two operations before like this. So here's an operation which is core to the compiler which says the typed operation takes an untyped tree and an expected type and it gives me a typed tree. And then we have another operation which is also used a lot, which is the subtype test. It asks whether one type is a subtype of another. So since both of these uh, functions uh, modify, access and modify state, uh, we would have to write them like this. So typed now takes uh, the same parameters, but we give you back a typer state, which is essentially the tree wrapped with the versions of these two variables. And this subtype will, would give you back a typer state of Boolean. So we could do that, and the advantage would be we would be much more explicit where this type of state is, but on the other hand, other things would get more complicated. So for instance, uh, where we would write now something like this, is subtype T1, T2, and is subtype T2, T3, if they're both true, return some result. Now you can't do that anymore because is subtype doesn't give you a Boolean, it gives you a type of state of Boolean. So what you'd need to do is you need to pull out the Boolean uh, using a flat map or uh, equivalently using this for expression. So we say, let's C1 be the result of this test. Let's C2 be the result of that test. If C1 and C2 both hold, then yield the result. And you have to ask yourself, why would this be better? Certainly more complicated, certain, certainly longer, more cumbersome, and probably will run slower as well. So what I want to argue here is that essentially it's all a question of trade-offs, and you have to know when you make the trade-offs. So 
a good way to visualize that is if you compare different languages with each other. And I think all these five languages, they're very nice, they're great languages, and they have completely different approaches to what types are. Uh, in Clojure, Clojure is a dynamically typed language, so all the compiler does statically is check the syntax. In Scala, we have a, a sort of more or less traditional language. We type check the arguments and results to functions. In Haskell, you could argue that uh, the scope of type checking goes further because we also type check effects using monads. Uh, in Idris, so you, it, we go even further on a different dimension. We essentially check, the compiler checks that values have certain properties, that values are equal or less than each other and, and things like that. And finally, if you want complete program correctness and have the compiler verify that, then there are essentially automatic theorem, uh, there are theorem provers, interactive theorem proving systems such as Koch or Isabel. So all these are uh, interesting approaches and none of them is exactly right in their approaches to typing or otherwise put they're all they're, they're all right in in their ways so it's a question of trade-offs uh, as you go from left to right uh, you have to write more uh, it's, it's and you get more essentially guarantees and you always uh, even in Scala you always have the question well to go further to essentially have further type checking capabilities, is it worth the added verbosity of, of my program? And that's a trade-off that everybody has to make. Uh, and there's no right or wrong uh, in, in these things. So in the compiler example that we saw before, I think I would argue that uh, the price here to pay is too high and that uh, essentially you can simply say by convention that a, the typed, uh, essentially typed functions and its, its, its siblings and its subtype and tests like that, yes, they can implicitly update this type of state. The, important is not, the importance here is not uh, that you track these things in the types. The importance was this. The importance is that you reduce the essential state to the absolute minimum. So I think that's, that's what counts, reducing the state to two variables, whether afterwards you want to type check them and put them in a monad or whether you want, want them to, to, to leave them implicit and just say, well, that's my state, that's secondary. Good. So um, if we summarize this part, then uh, for me, the seven fundamental actions that lead to the simple parts are composing, we compose expressions, uh, we nest scopes, we match with patterns, we recurse functions, uh, we abstract function values, we aggregate collections, and we mutate variables. And because uh, it's been shown that nobody, normal humans can't keep more than seven things concurrently in their head, I will stop at that. But I still want to talk about modules in the libraries. Uh, so modules can, in the libraries, for me, they can take a really large number of form. There's no single form of them. Um, a module could be a single function, <coughs> or it could be an object, or a class, or an actor, or a stream transform, or a microservice. The importance is that the in modules imply a change in viewpoint. You put the focus not so much on what modules do, but how they can be combined. That's the important part. And one uh, fact here that matters is that in Scala, because it's a statically typed language, modules talk about values as well as types. So you have to talk about types in your modules. So what Scala has as features for modular programming is, uh, I think, let's start with the basic. I think the first basics is a very rich vocabulary. So you have rich types with static type checking, and these essentially give you the things to talk about. It gives you the domain of discourse. Uh, it also gives us the means to guarantee encapsulation. Uh, static typing means that we can essentially abstract things. We, we can hide the actual implementation type of something and give you only a more abstract type, and that means we can change the implementation type later, which is essentially one of the core features of encapsulation that you need in modularity. Uh, then come the, essentially the uh, basic uh, elements. We start with the objects. We can parameterize what we have with objects and it becomes a class. And you can uh, then mix things together with traits. So where classes are essentially templates that 
can create modules dynamically with arguments, trace uh, more sort of mixable slices of behavior. So all these are basic, and I won't go further into them. Uh, the uh, remaining three I want to uh, con abstract, uh, concentrate on for the remainder of the talk. So the first one is uh, this idea that we can abstract by name. So what that means is that members of a class or trait in Scala can be concrete or abstract. And again, it's a very uniform principle that this abstraction applies not just to methods, but also to values and also to types, to everything that you have. You can essentially have that concrete or abstract. So a good example here is a library of graphs where you see what we have here is a trait graphs. And we say, well, uh, we want to have essentially a general library without tying ourselves to any particular form of graph or any form of particular implementation. So these graphs library would uh, just postulate that there is a type node, and we know nothing about it, and there is a type edge. But actually, we do know something about them, and namely that there should also be a function predecessor that takes an edge and gives us a node, and a function successor that does the same thing. And then we would say, well, given nodes and edges, which I just have essentially declared that they are there, but I haven't t told you what they are, they could be persons, and they could be anything else. Uh, I say, well, there's a graph now, and a graph is a type that would correspond to this graph signature, where the graph signature says, well, a graph signature uh, means that a graph should have a set of nodes and a set of edges. And then I would have some uh, convenience methods which tell me, well, given a node, I can produce the outgoing edges and the incoming edges and this set of sources. Okay, so that's a very simple way to get into this uh, idea of graphs. Uh, and it makes use of, a, I believe, a very simple and intuitive rule of abstraction, which says that at each level where you define, uh, in, put in a class what you know, define what you know, but leave abstract what you don't know yet. And that works universally for values, methods, and types. So let's um, fill some of that in. Let's say we now want to... Um, fix a implementation of these graphs. We still don't know what nodes, nodes and edges are, uh, but let's say we know what a graph is now. So let's say we just want to represent the graph in the most straightforward way we, we, we could imagine, uh, that it just consists of a set of nodes and a set of edges which are now given in the constructor of the graph. So these things now override these two definitions, nodes and edges. So here we have our, we just say, well, we want to have them given by parameters. And given that, we can define what outgoing and incoming is, namely, outgoing is just our edges filtered by the predicate that says the predecessor of the, of the node should be, of the edge should be an, and incoming would be the uh, edges filter successor of the edge should be our node n. And finally, the sources then would be all the nodes such that the incoming edges, uh, set of incoming edges is empty. So we can do all that, and we still haven't told you what nodes and edges are, but we have a very, very simple model of a graph. Of course, that's a model is ridiculously in, inefficient, uh, but it was the model that fit on one slide, so it's a very good way to start with graphs and a good, good thing to refine later. Oh, so we actually, uh, I have a topless paper with Tia Gromf, uh, and, sorry, a communication of the ACM paper with, uh, with Tia, where we then give you various implementations of these graphs, of fa fast sequential imperative, uh, parallel, concurrent, and so on. So... Uh, what we can then do finally is that we uh, give you a concrete model what kind of graphs we would want to use. Let's say nodes should be persons and edges should be pairs of persons. And then we would have to say, say the successor is the first half of an edge and the predecessor is the second half of an edge. And then we can take that concrete model and the, uh, the uh, abstract graph model and, can, and just mix them together, and that would be a final graph implementation. So what's interesting about this is here that there are really two sides of the same coin, namely encapsulation and parameterization. So you could say up here, 
That was encapsulation at, at work. So I haven't t told you what node and edges are. So you can't get at the details of what they are. You can't essentially break implementation invariants by doing some, getting, getting at some of the fields of them that I don't want to expose. In here, at the, at the concrete end, what I really do is by giving you now a concrete definition of these things is that I, I parameterize it. So hiding and parameterization are the same thing. Okay, so uh, the num point number six would be we have seen abstraction by name, which is sort of the fancy, the more exotic one. There's the more common one, which is abstract by position, which is just essentially function application. I pass parameters to a function. Now, since modules talk about types, let's see how that works with uh, types. So, of course, that's now much more familiar. We write list of plus t in a class list, so that would be covariant lists, invariant sets, and then we would have function. The function one type would have two parameters, one for the argument and one for the results. And we instantiate like this. We write a list of number or set of string or a function one of string and int. And the variance uh, of these things is accessed by this, these annotations plus and minus. Now, the variance is typically the baffling thing at all these things. That you say, well, I know what parameterization is, but what about this variance? That's complicated. But it's actually, what's interesting is that we can map these parameterized functions. We can map abstraction by positions into abstraction by name only. And we get, at the same time, a, an explanation of for what variance is. So let's see how that works. So the principle is very simple. The principle says, uh, the parameters are essentially just syntactic sugar for abstract members. And arguments are syntactic sugar for refinements that define these abstract members. So let's see how that would work in uh, detail. So here I write a class set, which is parameterized, which is generic. What I write here is the same thing, but uh, I, uh, it's equivalent. Uh, what I do, I just write a monomorphic set, so a set without parameters, but where I had the parameter before, I write a type member. Just say sets have a member and it has a type. I put a dollar in front of the T just to uh, signify that there's some name mangling going on and because I don't want to have in introduce name clashes that everybody calls their parameters T and then they would, would conflict. So set of string then, the instantiation of a set is the same thing as saying, well, it's my parameterless class set and the type $t equals string. So that's this refinement where I say, well, it's this type and in addition we have this constraint that holds. Uh, if you look at lists, then it's almost the same. So the class list is again expanded as before. But what's interesting is that now at the use case, when we write list of number at the instantiation case, that's different because here we would say, well, actually, if it's a list of number, then it could be a list where the type t is an arbitrary subtype of number. That's what covariance means, that a list of integers is a list of numbers. So that means that, that that's what we can express here. If we say a list of numbers, then it's a list that's essentially downwards open. I can have this type be instantiated with something more specific. Okay, um, so that principle is actually quite interesting because it, it is, is essentially leads to the basis of the new Scala compiler we're working on that we say we don't, we, we, that, that principle is just it's not just something that exists theoretically, but it leads to a much, much simpler and more regular compiler as well. So the last thing uh, for the modules, uh, I would pick uh, implicit parameters. So implicit parameters are a rather simple concept. It just means they're normal parameters, but you write implicit, and that means it, that you can leave off the parameter from the user program and instead the compiler will find an implicit value that matches the type. And there must be one and only one that gives you a best match or you get an ambiguity error. Uh, for the simplicity of its concept, it's actually amazingly versatile. So the first use of implicit, of course, it, it lets you model type classes. So here you see an example of that. You could, can define a minimum function of two uh, uh, parameters of type A, and you need to have a, co uh, a comparison 
uh, implicit of type ordering of A. So you need a value of type ordering of A that gives you the comparison operators and with that you can define a minimum. So that's the type class pattern, of course. Uh, the second uh, usage of an implicit is it lets you define a context. Uh, so for instance, uh, the type uh, function that I showed you in the compiler uh, takes actually an, an implicit context as an additional parameter that gives you all the other bells and whistles that a typer needs to know, the symbol table and the name table and, and all the other things, the current mode and so on. You put them all into the context and that context gets propagated essentially down the tree of calls into everything that the compiler does. And you don't need to write the propagations yourself. That would be very, very cumbersome and clumsy. The implicit parameter takes care of you. In a sense, that gives you uh, a, a notion, a very lightweight notion of dependency injection, because dependency object injection basically is about, I have this configuration value, how do I get that where it's needed? And implicit parameters give you the right, the, uh, a very flexible way for the glue of that. And the last usage of implicit values is as a capability. So, uh, for instance, you could have a function like access profile, access a customer ID, uh, access the profile of a customer ID, and I can do that only if I have admin rights. So uh, the uh, object-oriented capability model says, well, model capabilities with essentially unforgeable objects, you just create a new one. If uh, everybody who sees the identity of that object has the capability. Now, passing capabilities is of often very, very cumbersome, so it's an ideal use case for implicits because uh, what matters for capabilities is not the transmission path, but only whether I have the capability and you need it. So the way I pass this capability to, to, to you, the way I bunch them up and decompose them is completely irrelevant. And that's why it's a great, great case to just leave that to the compiler. So to summarize this part here is that uh, the module parts which we've looked at would be rich static types than the basics, objects, classes, traits. Abstract types that you abstract by name. Type parameters that you abstract by position. And implicit parameters are a great way to cut the boilerplate. So in summary, I believe this is a fairly modest and some might say boring set of parts that can be combined in flexible ways. It's my selection. Not everybody needs to agree on that. Uh, but uh, I, I think that's something that if I look at my coding, that's what works for me. That's what I use uh, in, in basically every line of code I do. There are, of course, also other parts in Scala that are either not as simple or don't work as seamlessly with the course. Uh, there are implicit conversions, so I've sung the praise of implicit parameters. Uh, I won't sing the praise of implicit conversions, which are sort of another way to often uh, essentially have very confusing behavior of a program if you use them too much. Uh, there are more complicated types like existential types, structural types, higher kind of types, which uh, are uh, currently in Scala, which lets you express certain things, but I have found actually they are not necessarily part of the core. The core are really these uh, parameterized types that in turn map to the types with the named members. And of course, then there are macros that let you e extend the language even further out. And you see a lot published about these parts because these are the exciting parts in the sense that people have often a hard time to figuring them out. And once they figure them out, they want, of course, to let the world know uh, what, what the big uh, gain in, in, uh, in, in knowledge is and how, how these things can, can be used to do rather neat things. But I think that's, that's all well, well and good, but they are, in my book, not the core of Scala, that they, the core that you should use daily. In, and by the way, all of these parts are under feature flags or experimental flags, so that means that you have to enable them explicitly, and that should tell you something. So uh, that means that uh, I believe the core of Scala are, is typically things that you, sh you, you won't need a language flag or an experimental flag for to enable. So my advice would be use only if you have a specific justification, and that specification should, could well be that you want to use Scala as a host for a domain-specific language or other language, that then, then these things can come in handily, but they shouldn't be part of sort of your, your, your daily, your daily um, uh, toolbox. Good. So that was my selection of what I think the simple parts of Scala are. Thank you very much for listening, and I'm happy to answer questions.
Hey, okay, so it's half a question, half a statement. The main problem I'm seeing with Scala adoption around me, also sometimes I have it, it's the language is still slightly too surprising, even looking at the simple parts. And I'll give an example. You talked about the collection framework. So you have, it's an old example, I think everybody who's done Scala programming here knows it, the map and the map values on list and map. So one is lazy, one isn't, and everybody gets bitten by it at least once performance-wise. Um, that's it's off the top of Good my head, point. but the, there's quite a lot of these, iterator and uh, take while, where you lose one, one element of the iterator because it's evaluated before, before the predicate is checked. Stuff like that, and I think saying, keeping Scala simple, would, this would have to be solved in terms of surprise factors. So, yeah, that's a good, uh, that's a good uh, remark. Uh, what map values is sort of the one thing that, that still sticks out. So when with Scala 2.8 collections, uh, we tried very hard to cleanly distinguish what's lazy and what's strict. So, so that's, why, that's why you have to write for everything else, you have to write view, point, something when you want lazy. And, and that map value is essentially <coughs> Uh, got left in there mostly for backwards compatibility reasons, and uh, indeed it's, it's, it's a point of surprise. I don't think it's one that that's only applies to Scala, though. That I, I think this challenge of saying what is lazy and what is strict, uh, essentially every language with, uh, with uh, collections has that. And uh, for instance, C-sharp even changed the meaning of the, of the for loops, uh, of the for expressions once uh, because it was too surprising for people. So I think these, the, the, there's, a, there's a tension here, but I take your argument. We, we might, we might we, I, I think it would be good to do something about map values, yeah. Um, I don't really see what the, uh, the sense of bottleneck sounds so absolute. And I mean, you can do something like functional programming with C. It's a little bit more work, but you can do everything there and it's uh, possible. Yes. Can you do functional programming with C? Uh, no, I, I, I would argue you can't. And, and the reason you can't is that um, functional programming is about uh, essentially transforming complex objects. Um, and uh, in C, you have the problem, of course, you can build complex objects out of pointers and structs, uh, stru structures and things like that, but you have this fundamental problem of memory reclamation. So that means you, ch you can't simply transform this object because somebody has, has to be responsible for the memory of these things. And so that, for me, is the fundamental bottleneck. Besides, of course, C uh, doesn't have closures that scope over the environment, so that's another problem. That, uh, that means you have function pointers, but the function pointer can't see any of the local, local variables of the points where you, where you create it. Hi. Uh, could you please uh, describe the future of Scala, Scala 3 or .t language you're working on? It's very interesting. So, so we, are, we, we are working on... Uh, we have a roadmap for essentially future versions of Scala. Right now, I think it's fair to say that we're still in a stage where we try things out. Um, the aim is definitely simplify, 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 where you can reduce complex features into, into simple ones. We will, we will try to do that. Um, it's too early to, do, uh, to, to say now what will the features be. Uh, what uh, we will do over the next year or so is probably start the SIP process, so invite the community to participate uh, to, to say, well, what should essentially a future major, major new version of, of, of Scala be? Uh, right now, uh, we're too early. So uh, what I wanted to get first done, and I think so far it's looking good, is to say, well, can we have a proof that these ideas that we can reduce everything to named members, does it hold up? Does it really essentially express what Scala is today? So that was essentially the reason why I started this new compiler project on the dot, dot, well, lang language code named Dotty and the compiler dot C. And uh, I think now the, uh, the take back from that is yes. So, so it, is, it is in fact Scala, it is, it is compatible, we can, we can essentially for all intents and purposes, map Scala into that subset. And that means that now we have a good basis 
with which to go forward, and that would be the next step then. So given that you've shown all these aspects in which you think about programming Scala, what would be your, your take on how to do complex tree transformations when you want to, you have a, like a recursive tree structure and you want to do nested rewrites and these sorts of things for which Kiyama is using this, this Stratego pattern, I believe, uh, because I found doing this relatively hard because you have to use product and then essentially you're doing reflection. Uh, hmm. um. I, are you alluding now to the fact that we have only fixed size products so until 22, something like that? Yeah. Um, so that's something where I, I believe we can actually do something better, and that's something we, 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 are look, we would be looking at for Scala 3 to say, can we essentially put what's now known as age lists directly into the product syntax? So essentially, if you have a tuple of T1, T3, T2, T3, then that would be uh, something you can actually recurse on. You would say that's the same thing as a thing which has its first element is a T1, and its second element is a tuple of T2, T3. Of course, the implementation then would still keep the flat tuples for efficiency, but from the type side, you can sort of decompose it that way. That's definitely very, very attractive, and I believe it will come in Scala 3. Thank you. Uh, will Scala be compatible with Java 8 clovers and single functional interfaces? Yes. Um, the, we're, we're working on the, the next version of Scala, Scala 2.12. Uh, it will uh, be compatible with Java 8 and SAM, uh, single abstract method interfaces. And uh, these things will be enabled even in 2.11 point releases over the next year. Uh, under, uh, again, an experimental flag, which uh, means that essentially you should use it only. There would be an experimental flag first also that because maybe some implementation details will change, but more, more importantly because uh, the difficulty here is not to fork the user community in a Java 6 and the Java 8 camp. So we would want to send the message for the 2.11 duration, the standard Java backend is Java 6, so everything should interoperate on Java 6, and then for the next one, Java uh, Scala 1, tw uh, 2.12, we would then switch to Java 8. But selectively, you can turn that on in the 2.11 one already. Um, you have just shown how to encode uh, variance annotations by refining abstract type members. Um, the left-hand side, which was uh, variance annotations, seems like it's a definition side annotation, whereas the, um, the abstract type members are just a, the usage uh, refinements. So Indeed, yeah. How can I enforce the user to only refine covariantly and not contravariantly? That, uh, yeah, that, 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 that's a good remark. So what I said, what I showed you here is essentially sort of the internal type structure that the compiler uses or that we use to, to think things. The user would still have type parameters, of course, and type fields and variance annotations. None of that would go away. But the, the difficulty with types is really that as you add more fundamental features, uh, they tend to essentially increase the complexity exponentially because of feature interaction. So there's a huge gain that we can have if we can take all these, these disparate features and map it onto one, uh, because that means we can internally reduce the complexity and also complete, reduce the complexity when we argue about these things. What should these things mean? How do we document them and so on? So that's why it happens. But it's, it's an interesting observation that yes, indeed, we have essentially then now just swap declaration side variants for use side variants. And for a pragmatic reason, declaration side is much better, I think. So uh, in that sense, uh, that's a good reason, another good reason why we want to keep these, these, these variance annotations on parameters. Hi. Who's got the Hi. mic? Uh, it was great uh, presentation. I have one question. Uh, I know the reason why input parameter is developed is to represent type classes via your research site permanent type classes. 
Uh, how do you think other users? I didn't quite catch that, sorry. Uh, can you repeat the question? Our uh, question? Uh, I mean, uh, I know the reason why English parameter is developed is to represent type classes ah. where you are okay. set parameter type classes. So why, why, why not have type classes directly and use implicits instead? Yeah, so uh, my, my first talk about, about implicits that implicits are two poor man's type classes. And the argumentation was, well, in, indeed, if you look at what a type class are, then there are a lot of object-oriented features. So they call them classes and instances, and there's even a form of inheritance that you say certain type classes essentially imply certain other ones. Uh, and then all this essentially gets uh, used to compose dictionaries that get passed uh, uh, implicitly to functions. So that's the Haskell story. Where in Scala, actually, we have all these things. We have classes and we have inter inheritance in the, in the base language. So again, for simplicity, we said, well, all we need is this little thing extra which says, well, the dictionary can be passed implicitly. A dictionary yes. in Scala, of course, would be an object. So, yes, I, yes. So, so the answer is language simplicity. Once you buy into object-oriented structuring methods, then you need only the implicits to get the type class functionality. Okay. By and large. I mean, there are, there are other, there are other Thank uh, you. differences. But, yeah. Okay, one more question. Uh, I think I, we should leave some time that we can go assemble before, before the big screen and uh, for the kickoff of the game. So one last question, please. Okay. Um, one criticism of the Scala C of the current implementation is that it uses a lot of mutable state internally and therefore is uh, single-threaded. Will that change for .c or for whatever is Scala C3 or something, or will it be multi-threaded? Uh, so I, I, I don't know yet. So they are, um, I mean, of course, being multi-threaded, using parallelism is uh, something that, that is very attractive because we might have all these cores lying around and we might as well use them. But to get a lot of performance out of that is difficult, as we all know. So we don't know whether, even if we could make things multi-threaded, whether we would get a big performance gain, so maybe we get a bottleneck in memory access or so things like that. You don't know before. So that's why my, my initial approach was to use the functional features to essentially do very, very aggressive caching and to get speed with that uh, that we it should make it also uh, less impossible so uh, to 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 uh, to to parallelize uh, but it will still be very very difficult so that would be a second step once we have the sequential version out there and we have explored how fast it can become that we say well what additional steps could we do and what would, would parallelism give give us there okay Thank you all, and I, okay. so yeah, th thanks.